So it's a little bit after 12, and I know we've got lots of folks listening remotely, so I thought we'd go ahead and get started, but feel free to trickle in and grab your lunch. Um, so I'm Carrie Stevens. I'm one of the faculty in the department. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm hosting a lovely colleague and friend of mine today, um, who is Dr. Roger Kessler. He is um, Chair of Research and Evaluation in the Doctor of Behavioral Health Program down at Arizona State University. And he's also uh, the co-principal investigator of uh, one of the most expensive ever funded trials on integrated behavioral health in primary care. And I'm very excited to be hosting him here at the university um, over the last couple of days. And he's gone around meeting lots of our colleagues and having lots of great conversations. So if any of you would like to also try to ping us and catch us for conversations, please do. And in the meantime, I look forward to everything, Roger, that you're gonna share today. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, I just want to be clear that this is one of the great honors of my professional career to uh, do grand rounds here. Uh, this is uh, the seminal institution in the area in which I work. Um, I have uh, used work that's come out of this place extensively. It's a major influence in my work. The quick story is for many years, I hassled Wayne Caton to uh, do a trial with me comparing the collaborative care model with the stuff that is happening around the country that's actually also started in uh, Seattle, the integrated behavioral health consultant model. And that never came to fruition, but what did come to fruition is an incredible partnership with um, one of the most exceptional uh, psychologists in working in integrated care in this country, my uh, colleague, uh, Carrie. And um, without her thinking and ideas, this trial would have never happened. So I'm appreciative to uh, folks for inviting me here, and I'm equally appreciative to Carrie for all of the wonderful ways that she helps me think things through. So we're going to talk about ultimately this trial that we're in the early midst of. Uh, we in fact have started interventions in a number of sites and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, prior to doing that, we're going to uh, just briefly talk about things that most of you are certainly familiar with in terms of the why bother question. I'm going to talk about some interim evolutions of our work that wind up assisting the overall project. Then going to get into discussing the integrated behavioral health and primary care trial that we're doing that have spawned numbers of other efforts that uh, primarily Carrie and I are involved in as a result of looking at the work that we have been doing with the trial and then talk about some next steps, if that's okay. So the view that we have, Carrie and I have, and certainly the trials organized around, is enhanced primary care. Um, we don't look at this as a mental health and substance abuse trial. We look at this as a primary care trial to look at how behavioral care is part of primary care might be able to enhance primary care outcomes and in those outcomes um, improve patient care at the uh, medical and clinical levels. There's a focus on comorbid behavioral conditions defined quite simply as uh, a chronic medical condition as well as a behavioral or behavioral health component that is impacting on and impacted by the medical condition. We know that there are multiple limitations of uh, clinical care folks with multiple chronic medical diseases if comorbid um, behavioral issues are not uh, identified. For example, we know that if you look at folks with two or more chronic medical conditions, somewhere in the area of 50 to 75 percent of them have an identifiable behavioral issue that's complicating the medical condition. If there are more than two, 
then there's really no reason to even measure because the probability is so high that there is interfering uh, behavioral conditions. So one of the consequences of this over the last 30 years has been the emergence of a variety of different ways of looking at um, responding to that issue. I think it's accurate to say that the most prevalent of those issues, of those ways of providing behavioral care, is to kind of go out and grab a behavioral health clinician, usually with modest training, uh, throw them in an office in a primary care clinic and say, we'll refer to you. And uh, that generally is referred to as a co-located care model, or at least within our rubric. That's how we would identify that. There's uh, limited engagement in the rest of the practice. There's uh, very little structural involvement. Uh, but it's become a highly prevalent way of responding to behavioral issues. What's happened more recently is a clearer understanding that there's a huge need in primary care to focus on patients that are creating major dilemma for primary care systems and primary care cl uh, clinics. That is, folks with multiple medical morbidities who are difficult to treat, frequently uh, do not generate desired engagement and outcome, and at a high frequency have a behavioral comorbidity. So there's been an evolution to that position. And as we started thinking about the trial that we're going to discuss in a moment, that winds up being the focus of our effort. So why I said this is not really a mental health or substance abuse issue is because it's, uh, it's not really a mental health or substance abuse issue and trial is because it's not a mental health and substance abuse trial. It's a trial of four patients who have multiple medical comorbidities that also have behavioral components to it. And one of the things that we know is primary care has to be the place to look at this because just like Willie Sutton said about Robin Banks, because that's where the money is, primary care is the place that um, patients are with multitudes of behavioral issues. And I, you'll notice I am framing this as patients with behavioral issues, and rather than saying patients with mental health and substance abuse issues. And there's fairly compelling data that in terms of the presentations within primary care, that are behavioral, only a small percentage of those patients are labeled with psychiatric diagnosis at all. So the need is much broader than psychiatric diagnosis for behavioral care. And who's interested in this? Our friends in the insurance company. Because here's some data from a major East Coast insurer uh, about two years of data uh, that has been reviewed by a colleague of mine by the name of Roger Cathal in Minnesota that is looking at the expense of chronic disease with and without a behavioral comorbidity. And the numbers are fairly staggering. And they're probably underestimates because of underdetection. So the costs of these patients are quite high and untenable to places that are like insurance companies that are trying to understand ways of providing efficient and effective care and impacting on their overall costs. Again, uh, a different way of looking at the fact that folks with two significant chronic diseases uh, wind up being uh, where there is this very large behavioral comorbidity wind up being amongst the uh, folks that um, are the most expensive to treat. We did a, a survey uh, with NCQA a number of years ago of NCQA patient-centered medical homes. And one of the things that we wanted to take a look at is what they were doing at the time, this is pre-new standards, but what they were doing in terms of behavioral presence within 
their clinics. And of those responding to this convenience sample, there were 42% that um, identified that there was a behavioral presence within their uh, department. And we see that much of that were case managers and uh, to some degree, social workers followed by psychology, followed by psychiatry. So there is no real reason to talk about the impact model. It is clearly the most effective documented research in the treatment of uh, depression and anxiety in primary care. And as far back as 1998, uh, where, where Butler were, was summarizing this work, it was saying the collaborative care model is clearly effective, but we don't know enough about other models of what's called integrated integration. We don't know what the core elements are that really account for much of the variance of these efforts. And we can't specify what the elements are if we were trying to instruct a clinic that here are the core elements to input into your build if in fact you want to generate an effective integration effectiveness model. Furthering the conundrum is there's been this major struggle to define what this thing is. The definitions are all over the place. There hasn't been a standard way of talking about it. Co-location and integration have been vaguely stated and used interchangeably. So what we can't even talk about what the phenomena is, let alone uh, define it terribly well. Resulting in a bunch of silos. So there's this primary care behavioral health model of integration. There's a collaborative care model, and there's, uh, which at least have some, both have some empirical and uh, conceptual support. And then there's what's done in practice a lot of the places, which is I'm just gonna go get somebody and check off the box because now we have a behavioral health clinician uh, in our practice doing something. <laughs> So one of the things we started thinking about was, what does it take to do it? Can any practice be effective at doing integrated care? Or is there some baseline of something that needs to be there if it makes any sense to even generate any behavioral care structure within a practice? So we started to want to look at practice capacity to provide integrated or collaborative care. So there's a brilliant psychologist in Minnesota by the name of C.J. Peek. And he once told a story, tells it sometimes still, about the Electrical Congress of 1884, when for the first time, multiple investigators looking at the phenomena of electricity were able to come together and discuss the phenomena. Prior to that moment in time, there was no standardized lexicon for describing electricity. So voltage, wattage, there was no standardization. And they got together and they agreed on a lexicon. And thus, a language came about that was able to identify the components of electricity. And from that, measurement of those components was thus enabled. So heeding CJ's idea, he developed the lexicon for collaborative care. How many folks are familiar with the lexicon? It, it would be something that would be uh, useful to Google. It is a ARC supported method of developing and identifying a theory of behavioral health integration. Identifying key clauses and key elements that if you were walking down the street and tripped over a behavioral health integrated practice, you would know that's what happened. The problem with the lexicon is twofold. One, CJ, like many brilliant thinkers, it takes at least a week 
to interpret a paragraph of his writing. Once you're able to do that, it makes complete and total sense, but it's very dense writing. The second thing is it's a theory and you can't measure with the theory. So there needed to be a translation. And about five years ago, we took on that task of identifying the key clauses, defining them, and creating a measure of level of process integration that initially began as the Vermont integration profile. And it was cool, you know, the V in Vermont was in the shape of the state of Vermont, which interestingly somewhat looks like a V. And it just associated integration with Vermont, which the university really liked and all of that kind of stuff. But after that, we got to the point of morphing it into a more generic statement and calling it the practice integration. So we created it to give greater specificity and measurability to the dimensions of integrated care. From that measurement, we then wanted to see if in fact the, we can validate such a measure. And three, without some sense of what do you have to have? If you look at Don Abedian idea about quality of care, he talks about structure and process as two of the three stools. So how do you assess whether and how much of, of structure and process are necessary in order to generate outcomes of care? Thus, we moved to the measure. It's an electronic survey. Currently, we have actually, since this slide was generated, we have over 1,100 uh, responses in the database. It's a 30-item measure of diff processes, six domains, takes plus or minus 10 minutes to complete. Here are the six domains that are evolved from the core elements of PEAK's lexicon. Workflow, services, space, shared care, identification, engagement. We're looking at uh, content analyses of the items at the moment, and uh, some other elements of uh, review that we have just done. And in fact, we may morph this down into to five domains in a subsequent version, but these are the existing uh, elements of care. By the way, I have no dilemma being interrupted if people have ideas or thoughts or questions uh, as we're going through, if I'm not being clear about anything. The uh, PIP has been used nationally in the vast majority of states, including Hawaii and Alaska, and is currently in the middle of a project in uh, China so we're generating a good amount of uh, spread uh, with that measure. We're in conversation with NCQA about potential application in some of its standardization uh, also. And we're right now in the initial phases of a project in Arizona, uh, where I am at Arizona State University, in which we are going to survey every primary care practice in the state of Arizona to get a read on the level of processes that support the potential for integration. We looked at uh, who we have recipients for, and there's actually a pretty decent spread of uh, people in a practice that are filling it out. We have found no significant differences between rater categories, which is pretty interesting. Thus. People are looking at the phenomena, at least with a certain degree of uh, similar perception and response. Mostly large practices. And uh, again, other than frontier practices, a pretty good distribution of where the responses are coming from. So we're pretty pleased as we turn a thousand. Uh, what we've been able to accomplish with this little measure. Um, across uh, the, the practices and respondents is the summary. 
that uh, process readiness for integration hovers above the midpoint, just above the midpoint. How to interpret that, whether the midpoint is sufficient for being able to mount a successful intervention, can't speak to that. But if we applied a standard grading rubric uh, to a zero to 100 scale, we would see that um, most places wouldn't pass. So, oh yeah, please. Since you offered, uh, can you speak about the workspace factor a little bit? And um, it stands out a little bit for me as wondering if it's been subsumed in another factor or is there good evidence that it really stands out as a factor? So it was theoretically defined as necessary. Your question is, does it really matter, for example? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by workspace? Where the behavioral health clinician is practicing in relationship to where medical care is being provided. Okay. So the highest form, so you score the highest on that, those elements if, in fact, the behavioral workspace was within the workspace that the primary care physician was providing care. Does that make any sense? Sure. You, you, you said that you might have five factors in the end. Which one is not as strong that you might, you might subsume under another factor? Well, uh, we're not sure yet. We're still looking at that data, and I'd be happy to comment on that sure. in a month or so when our <laughs> analytics get done. But um, it, 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 because it's not an outstanding shift. It's uh, okay, it's one of those things that we could potentially lump, um, but we're just still struggling with that. So I'd rather not share that right this second. Please. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Oh yes, thank you very much. Um, the, the, it may be mixed, uh, but the primary focus was on practices that serve adults. Uh, internal medicine practices, community health centers, family medicine practices, and initially we got a sample of community mental health centers so we could take a look whether there is in fact differentiation across practices. And the psychometrics, I don't know how this happened, but somehow or other we stumbled into fairly robust psychometrics. So it differentiates different types of practices um, very well. Um, our intercorrelations of items within domains are excellent, actually. Uh, so what's emerging is the psychometrics of the measure are at least somewhat potent. We still have more work to do. Uh, we're kind of trying to build the airplane while we're flying it, uh, as most of us are familiar with in some of our work. So. Taking that, saying, okay, we know something now about a readiness measure for being able to integrate. What's out there? And it was very clear that it was not going to be a comparison with the collaborative care model. That, that just did not seem viable. So Carrie and I began talking for an extended period of time in, you know, what does the field need to look at? And we decided that what the field needed to look at is, well, here's this, it's being argued as a primary care behavioral health consultant model that has a good amount of traction and uptake. And here we have this other hybrid thing, which is different versions of taking a behavioral health clinician, usually mental health and usually not substance abuse, by the way. That's another ancillary project that we're going to get to when we can. Um, and they're kind of co-located in the practice. Now, if you think about those two constructs, as you all know who have worked with collaborative care, it's not a simple process for a primary care process to implement a different way of providing care, even to subpopulations, requiring changes in practice flow, changes in medicine, measurements rather, changes in expectation of different um, clinicians who are participating in the project, that's not a simple task. And so this behavioral health integration focus, particularly to a clinical subpopulation, 
that is generally not attended to behaviorally in primary care. So I, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean you're a psychologist and you're treating insomnia or you're in treating diabetes or your uh, cardiac disease? I mean, what is, what is a psychologist's role in this? So there's this cultural shift. So it's a cultural shift. It's a procedural shift. It's an expense shift. It's a different being to do this. It's the same thing as when a primary care practice was told, now you're going to shift from a focus on acute care to patients with minor and modest uh, medical issues to focusing on populations of care who are very difficult, who have chronic disease and multiple comorbidities. Now that took meetings, that took thinking, that took time, that took arguments, that took EHR reprogramming, that took all this stuff. And moving to an integrated care model is no less potent of a set of changes. So it's a reasonable question for some people to say, look, why do I have to go through all of that if all I have to do is grab some behavioral health clinician and throw them in an office and make referrals to them? So if the outcomes of that model are effect size X at cost Y, and the outcome of integration is X.5 at cost Z, where Z is a dramatic escalation, then can one really make the argument in the healthcare environment to do all of this extra stuff? On the other hand, thus the hypothesis of the study, if in fact the effects of this set of activities are in fact generalizing effect sizes and impact on biomarkers and functioning that are significantly different than co-locating a behavioral health clinician. Well, that, that's an even more potent function, finding rather. And that's where we came up with, Carrie and I came up with the idea of doing this trial. And, you know, if the world was right, Carrie would be doing this presentation as PI of the project. But we got clear at the time that we were both too junior for our friends at Pecoria to say, sure, here's $18.5 million. And we didn't ask for $18.5 million. That's the funny story. The ceiling was $10 million with $4 million indirects. And so the way that Pecoria announces its funding is a TV show. Literally. They say, tune in Tuesday at 12 o'clock and we will reveal the winners. And that's what they did. You know, there, there are these people sitting around and there's the big board in back of it, right? And then they unravel one. And unravel one, not to anybody's surprise, University of Washington, right? And it was $14 million or something to that effect. And then they unravel number two and it was whomever for $14 million. And then unravel number three, University of Vermont, $18.5 million. And I said, oh, you know, their text screwed up and put a misprint on there, you know. Uh, so we got off of the TV show and then we got a call. And they said, we love your project. We don't like your method. And we want you to change your method. And the method that we want you to do it's going to cost you a lot more money. So um, that's how, that's the story of how we wound up getting $18.5 million. It wasn't our brilliance. It was Pecori's intransigence about an absolutely perfect step wedge design that they didn't like. Uh, in my opinion, it was perfect. So that's how that all happened. So aim one is a comparison of the two models. Aim two is, does the use of a rather specified process to implement generate better pro uh, outcomes than the simple location procedure? And aim three says, how, how do practice characteristics affect that? We're changing that to a different question. And that question is, you know, look, we are mounting a very significant perturbation 
of a primary care practice. Yes, we're focusing on an end of patients with specified conditions, but this is a big deal across the practice. And what happens in a primary care practice when all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, we are increasing behavioral focus as a primary focus of this practice, to this practice's patients. We're looking at workflows. We're looking at how you're thinking. We're looking at our data. We are training people. And we're asking, what's the consequence of all this? And for me, frankly, I would love for there to be findings in the first two aims. But what's most interesting and exciting to me is, can integrated care be integrated successfully in on-the-ground practices? The, uh, someplace in here, we have a, uh, a map of where all the sites are. Is that next? Well, no, here's, el here's our flow chart. We determine eligibility as determined by openness, willingness, and a score on the practice improvement profile below 75%. The contracting procedure is a bear, times 40 practices. And how many systems do we figure? 18-ish? You know, 18-ish different systems with which we had to do contracting. And so we're pretty much through contracting. We've randomized, I think, 14 of the 40 that are going to get randomized. There's going to be a huge crush of randomization between now and the end of the year. And we started up first in two practices to test the viability of all the different pieces. And we're through that, and we now have, I believe, three practices that have, in fact, become the intervention, uh, done the intervention. We're starting to collect baseline measures, letters are out to patients, the intervention will shortly follow, and then the observation period. This is the distribution of uh, areas around the country. Um, I'm actually negotiating in the Dakotas at the moment, just because there's too much white space in the middle. And, um, you know, it's uh, too much East Coast, West Coast stuff. And New England is highly represented because probably that's where I am and knew the most people. And, you know, what I do is have fairly good ideas that I don't really know how to implement. So I'm very fortunate that I have a series of great colleagues around the country. So what I always do with this pleading look on my face is call them up and I say, you know, we really should do this. I don't know how. Will you help me, please? And, and somehow or other, that old, tired way of approaching people has consistently worked. I mean, Carrie's a great example. I do it to her all the time. And uh, so I called on my colleagues around the country. And uh, this is what we have come up with. And this is an iteration of what I wound up saying. We did this slide last week, and we're really in, the, we're in a really dynamic period of time where things are changing a lot. But what's interesting is we identified 75 practices 55 remain in process uh, to be approved for randomization. So that's not bad. That's not bad in terms of uh, practices identified contrasted with those who look like they're um, uh, going to participate. Any questions so far? So what are we doing? I mean, that's a relevant question, huh? The intervention has a number of components. The first is education. We have developed 70 asynchronous training modules from 15 to 30 minutes of length that are designed for various disciplines within the primary care clinic, as well as the team. The overarching construct of our clinical model is team-based care. So for example, a physician is being asked to 
participate in four hours in 20 to 30 minute modules over three months of um, asynchronous modules about integrated care. And in addition, they're asked to participate in the team-based care models. So the, the total is plus or minus eight hours over the course of 12 weeks. So is it something? Yes. Is it uh, uh, doable? It's doable, particularly because uh, we appear to be on the verge of being able to offer type 2 recertification credits to physicians uh, as part of their every N number of your specialty recertifications. After the training, stage one of planning essentially goes to the highest level of the organization and said, this is what we're planning in your organization. Is it okay? You know, do you understand the implications of this thing? Are you willing to commit to it? Are there any parameters that you want to define that we can't go there? Whatever it is. The second stage winds up being a creation of a design team with a physician champion, as well as other key members of the clinic who are willing to put the work plus or minus eight meeting hours over the course of a number of months into thinking through what does the clinic look like at the moment? Where do we want things to be in the practice? And what are the things that enhance and limit the potential of doing that, and what kind of changes do we need to make in the project? With that plan, we move to stage three, which is implementing the plan. With facilitation, we have central project facilitation to a, pro, a, a clinic facilitator. So our role in the facilitation is not to do the facilitation. It's to support and help a clinic level facilitator engage in the improvement project. And then the last piece of it is the implementation and the continuous quality improvement as well as the monitoring of the consequences of the trial. As I mentioned, about 70 web-based 15 to 30 minute asynchronous modules have been developed uh, by colleagues at University of Massachusetts as well as Arizona State. It is a lean technology focused intervention. Our uh, colleague Connie Van Egan at University of Vermont has uh, extensive training in lean technology. She and I have had multiple supports from NIH to look at the implementation of lean based toolkits. And she is uh, constantly at work changing every three days uh, a toolkit for primary care behavioral health that will guide that planning and implementation process. So the toolkit makes a certain set of assumptions that there needs to be stepwise planning for implementation, identification of breadth and scope. You have to be able to impact on practice culture because without impacting on culture, intervention fails, period. And it's recursive. It is not a uh, start end model. It is rather a continuous process of looking at discovery. One of the interesting learnings so far in this project, as we'll talk about uh, now, is uh, that as we do everything, we discover all these other things that we need to do. So the operational strategies focus on provider engagement, rapid referral and scheduling, uh, team engagement in managing patients, including behavioral care, a system for identification, workplace reorganization as necessary, and focusing on how do you document to optim optimize team-based care. I'm gonna go through this. You can um, read those slides. Uh, and I mentioned that. The outcomes. So the, the focus of AIM-1 is biomarkers. Are hypertensive and diabetic outcomes changing as a result of this, in, in, of this procedure? Not a biomarker, but an indicator is what about rates 
of uh, subsequent cardiac events amongst folks who have had an initial cardiac event. We're looking at patient reports of symptoms and overall function. We're measuring practice level change and level of integration. And then, as I said earlier, we're looking at qualitatively, what are the contextual issues about what happened during the period of time of being engaged in this project? Other questions about this right now? Okay. So, as I said, one of the consequences of this is something would happen and then Carrie and I would go, oh, and we just say, here's another thing that we need to figure out. And so there are numbers of other works in progress. The first is the Sunflower Foundation in Kansas supported us to evaluate the outcomes of their spend on integrated care projects. And when I was putting together the national expert team to do this work, um, the first person I called was Carrie, of course. And uh, so we've been engaged in this project, and the project is to identify the measures and metrics of integrated care, focusing on clinical outcomes, process outcomes, and cost outcomes. And we're at the stage with that project, we're in conversation about an implementation in one or two Kansas sites to test what we have come up with. We've identified 15 targeted clinical and behavioral conditions for focus, including chronic medical conditions, mental health and substance abuse conditions, risk behavior and other medical conditions determined by an expert panel. Let me just say the expert panel is a very interesting group of folks that includes psychiatry, family medicine, psychology, uh, national policy, folks, um, health economics. Did I leave anything else? So a very varied group of people who have been working in this content area for some time. We're looking at coexisting physical and mental disorders, looking at at least one behavioral health condition and two medical conditions. And what we try to do is say, okay, we need to do a health risk assessment. We need clinical and biological indicators and we need functional indicators for each of the disease states or the cluster of disease states that we just talked about. So we identify the presence, we identify a standardized behavioral health risk assessment, persistent non-improving medical illness and behavioral condition, lab data, and functional data. For me, there's been a huge earthquake in the field in the last year related to the measurement of functional status. And that is, many of you are aware of John Ware, who is the author of the SF36. John has moved past the SF30, SF measures into a battery of measures roughly labeled QDIS. And the QDIS is a three minute web-based assessment not based on a standardized lengthy set of questions, but asks a very brief set of questions about assessment. And based on the answers given to those questions, there winds up being a new logic generated for the answer of those questions. And the median amount of time to complete the QDIS for the core, uh, the core measure is three minutes. So for me, that's a game changer. And part of my work at Arizona State is how do you take that and create it as a cloud-based solution such that it can be used across multiple different EHRs. So here's uh, process measures, cost measures, as well as the outcome measures that we just talked about. So, Carrie and I were on one of our phone calls and we said, you know, some of our colleagues are gonna ding us because we're not talking about, well, what's this person gonna do? So we met with Jurgen yesterday 
And Jurgen was saying, you're doing great thinking about structure and how you're going to build structure. But in addition to the, the structure, what's the core of the sauce that is given to the patients that's going to impact on the change? And we got clear uh, about a year ago that we hadn't moved in that direction. So our current work, a lot of it has to do with exactly that developing these core elements of integration and how we're going to measure them. And actually, we were in a meeting a, uh, an hour ago when all of a sudden we had an aha about how we're going to measure them. So here are what we are perceiving as the dimensions of the core measures. And those of you who are involved in collaborative care model and impact will recognize many of them. And what we're going to do we're arguing for a model agnostic set. These can be operationalized in a number of different ways of delivering care. And what we want to be able to do is measure the dimensions across any model of care. So patient centricity, treatment to target, evidence-based behavioral interventions, conduct, efficient team-based care. Team-based care really becomes much more of a core of behavioral health than going into the office with a patient and sitting there and delivering an intervention and to populations of patients. We're gonna take that, we're gonna create measures and then we're gonna move on. What we are looking to do is a practice-based model to evaluate effectiveness of enhanced primary care. So we're trying to take these pieces that we have identified, the PIP, the core elements, the things that we're gonna learn and uh, put them together in a model to evaluate the effectiveness of care, identify a methodology such this data is able to be collected in on the ground practices using electronic procedures mostly, and then take a look at creating a large data set around which to analyze the answers to those questions. So we're looking to have core elements and metrics integrated into a unit enhanced by applications of bioinformatics. And you can't not do the bioinformatics piece. The age of idiosyncratic data collection and figuring out, well, I saw it here and I saw it there, that has to be over. And there has to be a way of using informatics solution to summarize and synthesize all of that data. The financial model doesn't work yet. The new CMS codes will enhance the ability of the collaborative care model, but it will not do sufficiently to enhance the activities that the majority of practices on the ground are doing. And we're gonna have some lessons, further lessons, once we take a look at the data in the IBM PC. And once that's all together, I'll come back and report on that. Because it has to be done in on the ground uh, practice. If the uh, Diamond Project taught us anything, it taught us that implementation in resource available practices is not the same as implementation in research starved practices. And the things that need to be done and accounted for are very different in those practices. So this is what Phoenix, Arizona looks like. I'm from Northern Vermont and I've been there for 35 years. So every time I go to Phoenix, I just stop and say, here's a city sitting in the middle of the desert. And that's always very amazing to me. I don't think people are really supposed to live in the desert, but <laughs> millions of people do. So thank you all very much for listening to my ideas. And I'd be most happy to uh, have a conversation and have a discussion about some of the things we've been talking about. <laughs> Any thoughts? Please. Because I'm just curious if you can comment on the cost issue, because I think that's the biggest argument against 
for example, embedded psychologists at Herman Hoff in Miami. Um, I know I'm a gerontologist at Penn, and I know Medicare is a big part of the issue. But so much of this work is non-delegable, right? It's consulting with providers, it's really the back team processes. And so do you just have thoughts on I do. So the first thing is, I can only comment from Vermont because that's where I've practiced for 35 years. And I will be clear, Vermont is a weird place in terms of healthcare. Uh, and it's probably a richer environment, insufficient, but a richer environment than a lot of places. And my department, our Department of Family Medicine when I was there, um, continued to pay me. And they continued to pay me because I was doing all of those non-billable things, but I knew how to work the, the billing system such that I continuously over the course of years was able to generate from four to 7% positive financial contribution. So I, I think that part of the conundrum of behavioral health clinicians in primary care is um, lack of information about how to take advantage of existing financial structures uh, and a straw man that, you know, I don't know this, I fear it, I don't wanna have to deal with it. So it's not financially sustainable. Plus the fact that the current financial model just doesn't do it. Please. Oh, I was just gonna say, so we have, like I'm part of the behavioral health community. Uh -huh. patient program here. And we actually bill, like I'm a social worker, and I bill therapies to like individuals because for therapy, I don't know how much money, I don't know how much money I actually bring in. But you should know that. You should know that because you're going to, get, as a social worker, you're going to get asked the question, how much of your costs are you in fact supporting? Yeah, at our, at our team meetings, we are told every two months, like, how much, like, if we're getting any, like, uh, um, like, things are getting rejected or how much money we're bringing in. But we, like, we lost funding. We lost part of our CHW, like, money one year, and we were able to, like, finish up a lot of that. How many of you are behavioral health, non-physician non behavioral health clinicians in the room? How many of you are absolutely clear about your financial standing in your departments? <laughs> Everybody has to be. You know, your job as a behavioral health clinician is to be part of the business of behavioral health. In the Doctor of Behavioral Health program at Arizona State, no person can graduate from the program without creating a business plan for the sustainability of their work in their setting. If we don't do that, we're left to the winds and we're gonna fail. Any other questions? Please. I'm sorry, can you ask me once more? Is foolish the same as full? I'll tell you what it means. Yeah. That um, if in fact you're gonna prescribe, then you have to do it under the supervision of a psychiatrist. Dr. Washington, I, as well you should. Okay, I just wondered if that was like integrated in the model, because it's kind of interesting that nurse practitioners are kind of being seen as that middle ground where if we're trained in behavior therapy, we can go for a lot of like diagnostics, so the notion that it is the behavioral health clinician's job to do behavioral care in primary care is totally 90s, man. You know, it's the job of the primary care team and members of that team working up to the scope of their license that are involved. We did a diabetes trial in which we were able to demonstrate a reduction in A1Cs in a behavioral trial in which only 14% of the sample ever saw a behavioral health clinician. The behavioral health clinician was in the planning and design of the uh, integrated algorithm, um, but a uh, care manager and medical assistant, uh, assistant did the majority of the interventions. The data suggested that those patients did not need to see a behavioral health clinician in, in that particular trial. And I was totally happy. I only want to see the patients that I must see because of the skill set that I bring. If somebody else has the skill set to do those things in the practice, we have plenty to do. There's no way a behavioral health clinician 
in a primary care practice can respond to the range of need that exists in that practice, particularly in a practice that really gets the importance of behavioral care as part of medical treatment. Anything, other questions, please? So please. Based on that, were you able to find a way to build through your consultation of the practitioners actually doing the care, or did you have to find another way to sort of justify your, your work? I used the tried and true academic medicine model to get paid for that. What was it? I got a grant which is a stupid way to do it, but and given the financial system. And when grant funding runs out, does the medical center pick up the cost of equipment? Yes. In this one clinic, but they haven't generalized it to the rest of the system. Other, well, thanks for putting up with this. I appreciate you being here and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>